Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Buffalo Bill Center of the West. My name is Eric Rossborough. I'm Associate Librarian and Senior Cataloger, and we're very excited to have the next installment in the Local Lore Program. We've got a good one for you today. Bob is going to be talking about the history of Buffalo Bill uh, Dam, Shoshone Canyon, and Hayden's Arch, Hayden Arch Bridge. He has brought in some special outside talent today. Anyway, I'd like, we'd like to thank Mac, Bob, and I would like to thank everyone that's helped put this together. We got Jeff Shrin filming, we got uh, Sam Hanna and John Gallagher in the booth, we've got Jeff Dunham doing last minute help for us, and a whole bunch of other people, Gretchen Heinrich with crowd control. And we couldn't do it without all those people. But anyway, real quick, we get the next one coming up is gonna be on October 19th. And it will be on early day Western movies, including the local movie, Rider of the Painted Horse. You're not going to want to miss that one. Anyway, I give you Bob Richard. Thank you all for being here and being with us. Uh, I learned more preparing for these talks. I thought I knew all about it, and I learned so much more getting ready for it, but to my left, I've got Burl Churchill, a classmate of mine that uh, is gonna share today a movie first, and we also have Leslie Slater Wilson, who is the manager of the Buffalo Bill Dam Visitor Center, and she's gonna have an open house on Saturday, but we'll get into that, and there's also brochures about the dam, and Growing up, I remember more about the dam hill than I did the dam. But hopefully we won't get into too much of that today. But anyway, thank you for being here. We're going to get started. And uh, if you have questions, I have two experts right here that can answer them. And Mac found more things in the archives a couple of days ago and has injected more photographs. But we will try to stop right at 1 o'clock, and we'll have a little time for questions. Uh, we're ready to go. Mac? Welcome to Wyoming and to Park County. We hope you enjoy your stay here at the Visitor Center and have time to take in many of the other interesting sites in our area. I'm Burl Churchill, and today, Dennis Davis and I would like to present a short history of the construction of Buffalo Bill Dam, the keystone of the Shoshone Reclamation Project. The project was one of the first federal irrigation projects in the nation. The dam was one of the first concrete arch dams built, and when completed in 1910 was the highest dam in the world. The storage reservoir behind the dam holds 640,000 acre feet of water and is refilled each year by the snows that melt in the high Absurka Mountains on the east border of Yellowstone Park. Originally the dam was built solely for irrigation of arid land. This area of Wyoming has only about five or six inches of annual precipitation. Farmers completely depend upon the stored waters from the reservoir behind the tall dam. Over the years the dam became a multi-purpose structure. Today the water stored in Buffalo Bill Reservoir is used for irrigation of the 93,000 acres of Shoshone Project farmland for power generation, municipal and industrial purposes, and recreational activities. Construction of the first phase of the project, consisting of the Buffalo Bill Dam, a smaller diversion dam located 16 miles downstream, and the distribution system for the first division of the Shoshone Project, was authorized more than 100 years ago, February 10, 1904. $2,250,000 were set aside to get the work started. Surveying and mapping of the project began immediately after the 1904 authorization. Reclamation service engineers chose this spot, which constructing engineer D.W. Cole called the perfect wedge to locate the dam. The first order of business after the surveys of the dam site were completed was to build a road to the construction area. This proved a daunting job. 
Beginning in the spring of 1904, strong back workers used pick and shovel and dynamite to gouge an eight-mile road through sometimes solid granite from the Cody Depot to the construction site. The task took a little over a year. On September 5, 1905, a Chicago-based firm, Prendergast and Clarkson, was awarded the contract for construction. Just over a month later, the contractor was building the camp on the hills west of the dam site. Drilling to find bedrock for the foundation began almost immediately. It took 10 months for workers to hit bedrock. Before the actual dam construction could begin, diversion works had to be built to enable contractors to work during the low water months from September through April. Nearly all of the construction of the dam had to be done during the winter months because the floodwaters coming from the north and south forks of the Shoshone River during May, June, and sometimes July made building the dam in the summer months virtually impossible. Work on the diversion system started in November 1905. Work limped along during a cold December. Government officials scolded the contractors for unacceptably slow progress. Construction efforts did improve in early January 1906, especially after 20 head of fine young mules, large animals with harness, arrived from Kansas City. In late February, the first water was diverted through the flume, enabling the construction of the last section of the temporary dam. Then, severe winter weather with zero temperatures and snow set in, and work slowed. Once again, reclamation officials met with a contractor and insisted the contracting firm come up with proposals to hurry the work. After five months on the job, reclamation supervisors accused the firm of generally ineffective work and poor management characteristics. The diverting dam was completed just before water from the first of the spring snow melt began to flow over its crest on April 17, 1906. A week later, the flume began to fail. The failure was primarily caused by neglect of the contractor to keep up the backfilling alongside the flume. Repairs to the flume and dam were begun, but in June, the major flood of the summer completely destroyed the flume and badly damaged the diversion dam. At this time, it became apparent that Prendergast and Clarkson could not complete the job. In August, the company's contract was suspended. Work at the dam drifted along haphazardly for more than a month before the bonding company for the first contractors, U.S. Fidelity and Guarantee Company, took over the project, promising no delay in carrying the work to conclusion. A dilatory and procrastinating policy was developed, which became a conspicuous feature of the entire administration of the U.S. Fidelity and Guarantee Company. Cold weather in December 1906 and early 1907 further delayed the work. Equipment broke down, supplies ordered by the contractor were not paid for, and the company's job coordinators were not qualified to manage such a huge task. Eventually, a change in company supervisors gave new hope that headway could be made in the construction. In March, the workforce at the dam increased to 275 men. The weather warmed, and concentrated effort was made to complete the flume before the spring floods. In late April, that connection was made, and repairs to the diversion dam were begun. For the first time since construction started almost two years earlier, reclamation officials were pleased with the progress. Then, friction began to develop between the company supervisor and the foreman. Work soon degenerated into the usual haphazard, careless, and unscientific methods of the past. To add to the personnel problems, floodwaters began to course down through the construction site. From July 2nd through July 5th, the highest flood ever recorded on the Shoshone River occurred. About 14,000 second feet of water came rushing down the construction area on the 4th of July. The next day, a run of logs from an upstream sawmill came thundering down the river and washed out the south half of the diversion dam. This 1907 flood, like the one of the year before, seemed to break the contractor's spirit and nearly deplete his capital. In late August, the government discussed suspending U.S. Guarantee's contract, but finally agreed to let the company continue work through the winter months. Work that winter was concentrated on the excavation of the deep foundation pit for the dam. Reclamation officials reported a really effective beginning was made in December. 
The difficult working conditions through the bitterly cold winter months added more problems for the company. Some of the foremen quit or were fired for incompetence. Finally, supervisors were chosen from the ranks of the workers at the dam, and they turned into reasonably good executives, considering the difficulties of the situation, and fair progress was made in excavation of the foundation pit. Even though competent foremen were finally at work, the common laborer grew unhappy with the grueling work and low pay. That winter, the first labor strike ever called in the state of Wyoming began at the dam. Laborers demanded a raise in pay to $3 for a 10-hour day. The new wage scale marked a scale of pay that was perhaps 20% higher than any other in the Rocky Mountain area. Despite the labor problems, which placed an additional financial burden on the contractor, bedrock at the bottom of the foundation pit was finally uncovered. By the end of February, the contractors were again behind in the work, and the Reclamation Service Journal of March 7, 1908 noted, the organization does not improve a bit, rather the contrary. It is capable of doing but one thing at a time. By the middle of March, the contractor's finances were stretched to the limit. Workers were unhappy, managers were incompetent, and Mother Nature had dealt several blows to the second company to attempt construction of the dam. Finally, a little more than a year and a half after they took over, U.S. Fidelity and Guarantee Company gave up the Herculean task. The contract was transferred immediately to another Chicago-based company, the Grant, Smith & Loker Company, and for the third time, a new firm came to the rugged Shoshone Canyon to try to build the world's tallest dam. The new company started work at the dam in March 1908 and began racing against time to start placing concrete at the foundation of the dam and to bring the retaining wall up to the bed of the river before the start of the spring runoff. For the next six weeks, significant progress was made. The first concrete was placed at the base of the dam. Engineer Cole was pleased with the progress of the construction, but discouraged by the lack of experienced workers. At 11 p.m. on March 30th, he wrote a colleague, I think you would be glad to know that we put the first batch of concrete in the dam at 10.06 this morning. I have just come up out of the pit dead tired, dirty, and discouraged. I don't know how it ever got noised around that this is an easy matter to build concrete with unskilled labor. Despite the improved progress at the site, the contractor still had no control over the high water that started in the spring. Just two days after the workmen got the retaining wall level with the bed of the river, the floods came and the foundation pit was flooded. High water continued throughout most of the summer and it wasn't until late August that the flow of the river dropped enough that the foundation pit could be re-excavated. By late September, concrete work began again. While the new firm greatly improved the operation, reclamation officials were concerned with the frequent and tedious delays from all imaginable sources and periods when progress was smooth and uninterrupted were exceptional. 350 men were working at the dam at this point. The old saying, if you don't like weather in Wyoming, wait five minutes and it will change, was true most of the rest of the fall. Sometimes the men worked in blizzard-like conditions. An unusual eight-inch snowfall, which melted quickly, caused flooding of the entire work area. Then the weather turned sunny and dry. The dam contains no steel reinforcement. The entire structure was built using a layer of concrete, followed by placement of granite rocks weighing from 25 to 200 pounds each over the top of the concrete. By early spring, it was apparent that the dam could not be completed before the upcoming flood season, yet the structure needed to be several feet higher before the high water came in order to protect the bridge and concrete mixing plant, both almost nearly in the path of the main current during high water. For several weeks, workers raced against the clock to get the dam raised, and on March 29, 1909, work stopped for the summer. All the contractor had to do now was wait for the runoff to see if the construction site was secure. The first flood waters came on May 27. By June, the runoff was about 12 feet over the dam. Then in July, the water topped the dam by more than 17 feet. The structure came through the flood period in great shape. 
man had finally won a battle with Mother Nature. In September, concrete work resumed and work rapidly progressed despite the fact that another strike was threatened. This time, the contractor decided he wasn't going to deal with the group that wanted more pay. He fired the strike leaders and reassigned other workers to the foreman positions. The October workforce numbered 450 men. The month of October was considered the time of maximum accomplishment of the entire five-year construction period. During this productive season, 130 feet were added during a nine-week period. From November until the dam's completion, the weather was unusually cold and all concreting had to be done under cover. In an issue of the engineering record, D.W. Cole spoke of the problems involved with placing concrete during the exceptionally severe weather. He wrote, It became an arduous and expensive struggle to build such work in the face of severe frost without deterioration in the quality of the resulting concrete. However, the contractor was determined to complete the work and by liberal use of coverings replaced and removed after each layer, the lavish consumption of coal for hot water and steam heating, by persistent and unremitting labor, and finally by enclosing the entire top of the dam under a steam heated tent, the thing was accomplished without any deterioration from the high standard of work, even when done with the temperature way below zero. The cost, of course, was excessive. The month of December was the coldest on record. One day, the thermometer registered 16 degrees below zero. On December 27, 1909, only 17 feet was left to put onto the dam. Despite the frigid conditions, determined crews struggled their way to completion. Cheers echoed through the canyon at 11 o'clock Saturday morning, January 15, 1910, when the last bucket of concrete was placed. The temperature was 15 degrees below zero. The tallest dam in the world was finished. Seven lives were lost, three workers lost limbs, three were blinded, and at least 28 others were severely injured. And all three contractors, including the last one, suffered phenomenal financial losses. Cost of the dam, spillway, and tunnel was $929,658, nearly double the original bid. When completed, the dam was 325 feet high and towered over the U.S. Capitol. The dam was originally called Shoshone Dam, but in 1946, President Harry S. Truman signed a proclamation renaming the dam Buffalo Bill Dam to recognize William F. Cody's contribution to water development in the area. In 1919, work was begun on construction of the power plant located just below the dam. The plant went online in 1922. During construction, tunnels had to be enlarged on the road, affectionately called the dam road by locals, to get trucks loaded with valves and transformers through the narrow tunnels. Because of outdated equipment and safety concerns, the plant was taken offline in 1979. In 1985, a major modification project was undertaken to raise the dam by 25 feet, enlarge and gate the spillway, build a new power plant about 4,000 feet downstream from the dam, and increase the storage capacity of the reservoir by more than 250,000 acre feet. In a unique cost revenue sharing partnership between the state of Wyoming and the federal government, the state contributed $52 million to the approximately $132 million cost of the modification project. Although not a part of the state-federal cooperative agreement, the visitor center was built at the same time. When the dam was completed, the editor of the Cody Enterprise wrote, The building of the dam brought those charged with this responsibility in contact with all sorts of almost insurmountable difficulties. For many of these, there was no precedent to guide them, and the work called for strong inventive genius and stronger initiative. The vexatious problems were met and solved one after another. It is a record of which these men may well feel proud. The Shoshone Project, anchored by Buffalo Bill Dam, is the fulfillment of man's dream 
to make the desert bloom and create economic opportunity for the people of Northwest Wyoming. We hope this brief history has been helpful and you have time to enjoy the exhibits here at the Visitor Center. If you have any questions, the staff will be happy to try to answer them for you or to direct you to another source to learn more about this magnificent structure. Enjoy your stay in wonderful Wyoming. back in control. <laughs> These are some signs up the North Fork telling about pre-dam uh, days. This is an image of the uh, confluence of the South Fork and the North Fork of the Shoshone River right there at the mouth of the canyon. <clears throat> the town of Marquette which disappeared beneath the waves once they started to fill the dam, the reservoir, I should say. Now, some of these pictures that we'll see here have already been shown in the uh, video. But we'll go ahead and run through everything as, as best we can here. There's a lot of slides to go through, so bear with us. Here you can see uh, the ladders running down from the road. <laughs> And you can see why they picked this site to build a dam because, you know, it's very narrow at the bottom and not much wider at the top. Solid granite makes great abutments for the uh, edges of the dam. I mean, it's an ideal location. But there sure was an awful lot of water that came down through there during that, that period. This is a view up or, or down river on the old road. And this is looking back up the river from approximately the location of uh, part of the, of the man camp and the uh, engineer Cole's residence. <coughs> This is a view that you would see typically from the top of the dam, but this is before it was actually built. They're standing on the side of the, uh, uh, of the, of the cliff over here on the, on the right. There's the construction camp on the west side of the dam. And then we have a series of pictures <coughs> of the uh, diversion dam and the flume when it was uh, taken out the first time. This is engineer D.W. Cole, by the way. Burl? Uh, D.W. Cole had a high school education and before he retired he had built 15 of the major dams in the world and was one of the the most renowned constructing engineers ever. Amazing. You can always see, uh, recognize him because he has his hand on his hip like he's very much in control. doesn't look like that's supposed to happen. <laughs> it amazes me that uh, all the construction had to be done in the winter time. Because obviously in the summer there was too much water. Too much water. And they didn't have car harps and uh, warm clothes like they did uh, when we uh, added to the dam. I talked to one of the um, 
men working on the, the uh, modification, and uh, they were cold. Uh, and so you can imagine what the people in 1904, 1905 were. We had a visitor, visitor there a couple years ago whose grandfather worked on the original dam site. He said it was so cold that they used to heat the dynamite up in the kitchen oven. <laughs> Just want to make sure it'll detonate. <laughs> Here's a shot of the uh, construction workers as they're beginning to dig down in the, where the spillway was at. And if you look way over here on the right side of the picture, you can see men with wheelbarrows as they're gathering rock and pitching it off to the to the side into the area where the reservoir is going to be. And this was just basically a big bathtub drain. But it was built at the, uh, just below the height of the dam. We'll have a picture of that here later. <coughs> well, there they are digging out the, uh, down to the uh, bedrock. And this was the bedrock pit. Uh, pit. And everything seemed kind of fluid and smooth, and that's because of the eons of water that had gone down this spot, rolling rocks and uh, all kinds of debris and just the wear and tear of the river itself, polishing that stone. I believe it was 80 feet before they found bedrock. Before they found, got down to the bedrock. I think you're right. It's quite a deep pit. The following photos are from the collection of R.C. Sober, and I'm not quite sure what position he held, but he um, had he had quite a lot of really good uh, photos. And then also construction engineer D.W. Cole I have these all mixed together. That's the South Fork of the Shoshone, and out here on this big flat area, there were a number of ranches including one somewhere way out here that they called the Buffalo Ranch, which belonged to Buffalo Bill Cody. So he, he was one of the individuals who got bought out by the government to, in order to uh, uh, transfer their property rights and everything to someplace else so that they could have this area to inundate. And the town of Marquette was uh, right about here, I think. This is Engineer Cole, down on the bedrock. This is uh, Engineer Cole with his wife and his uh, three daughters. And the building, uh, the stairs that you see there go up to the residence that they built, that he had built for himself. He called them the whole damn family. The whole damn family. <laughs> <laughs> lady and their three children came from Marietta, Georgia to live with their husband or her husband while the dam was being built. Talk about courage. For sure. This was much later in the project. This shows Cole and his wife and two of his daughters down in the bottom of the dam. These are the valves that open up the uh, pinstocks to release water from the dam. This is the very bottom of the dam. And there once again is the gut of the canyon looking upriver before the dam was built, before any construction had taken place. More views of the uh, bedrock. And here we are in the beginning phases of construction. I believe that's concrete mixture. Yes. And it, it was a kind of a movable factory. They would run it in different, uh, they would jack it up or they'd move it down to the base of the dam. They did all kinds of things with that uh, 
concrete factory. There's the pin stocks that have been laid. And here are the workers placing the granite boulders in the layer of concrete, and then they would cover it with another layer, let it settle just a little bit, and then repeat the process. And so, as you can see, this is basically a hand-built dam. The That's another thing that's so amazing about that's this right. structure. The contract uh, said that the uh, rocks placed in the dam should be no heavier than two men could carry. So it was 25 pounds minimum up to 200 pounds. Wow. Here they are a little bit higher up. And even higher. Uh, again, work on the spillway. And they, this is the deep end of the spillway over here, and then they dug a tunnel, a vertical tunnel, not vertical, but uh, an angled tunnel that goes down uh, to the, the uh, level of the, of the river below the dam. And that's where you see uh, the outflow of the spillway uh, even today. Um, I have to mention that it was kind of a rite of passage when you were going through high school during the winter time to actually crawl down through the spillway. I did it a couple times. It wasn't that, wasn't that difficult and it wasn't dangerous at that time of the year. <coughs> illegal. It, it, illegal, yes, but. <laughs> Only if you got caught. Only if you got caught. <laughs> I remember coming out uh, with a friend of mine, and we walked over to the uh, base of the powerhouse and climbed up the outside uh, uh, ladder, the rungs ladders, and went in through the back door of the powerhouse and waved to the, uh, uh, to the engineer on site, who happened to know us. <laughs> We've been fishing <laughs> with our camera gear. <laughs> and there's the, uh, the tent, the drying tent on top of the dam. And again, the photograph of the last bucket. They said that the um, having to cover the dam, uh, keep the concrete warm, uh, was second to the cost of labor for the whole cost of the dam. Here's the concrete uh, plant again, but this is from the west side of the dam. This is where the water would pile up eventually. And you can get an idea of the size of the thing from this image. And there again is the west side of the dam before they started to fill the reservoir. And you'll notice up here on the top of the dam, the railings have not been put in place as yet. Now here's the one that I mentioned. Here is the dam. Here's the top of the dam right there. And over here is the top of the spillway. Um, does anybody remember what the difference in elevation was between the two? I don't either. It wasn't that much. But I also remember that big flood back in the 80s that uh, took out a couple of the bridges on both the North Fork and the South Fork, filled up the uh, uh, Buffalo Bill Reservoir uh, to way over overflowing, uh, washed out of several campgrounds uh, all along the, uh, uh, both rivers, and was pouring over the top of the spillway by about six feet. And you could go out on the top of the dam and look over into the chasm and see all the uh, great flood of rushing waters coming down through the spillway and then turn around and go over onto the reservoir side of the dam and reach down and touch the water. 
That was kind of bizarre. <laughs> These uh, following photos uh, were taken by my grandfather, Ned Frost. This is the uh, uh, last tunnel before it starts up the uh, dam hill. And the folks in Cody called it the dam hill and that's spelled with an N <laughs> on the end. It was 1916 before the road was uh, completed on the north side of the reservoir. Uh, so they couldn't, well, 1916 is when you were able to go to Yellowstone Park on this road. Otherwise, you had to go around the South Fork side. And uh, I think it was right there at the, oh, I've lost it. Uh, right up above the reservoir where the road connected them. Uh, Red, Red Pole Bridge, isn't that it? This is the, uh, the road itself. The dam, this is the tunnel that was built through the end of the uh, granite bedrock there. And the road coming along, here's the spillway. And the road along the edge of the reservoir past the old uh, camp. And these were pictures that granddad had taken by climbing up on the side of Cedar Mountain and looking down into the dam itself, down into the uh, east end of the reservoir. And then they also had to drill a couple of tunnels through the uh, abutment of limestone rock right here, and that's where those double tunnels were at. All kinds of pictures of the dam hill. And here's a whole bunch of tourists who are up uh, in the white out there, just above the spillway. Cody Lions Club used to have, uh, a long time ago, had a, uh, a raffle. And you would, you would pay your dollar or however much it was, and you would write down the time, the date and the time of day that the water would start to go over the spillway. And um, I think they would split the tank with the winner. And they could raise a great deal of money that way. <laughs> and here's those tunnels. Um, there's one tunnel right here that the car is going through, and then right behind us on the left is the second tunnel. These now are photos from uh, the Jack Richard collection here at the McCracken Research Library. That's Jack Richard, who's Bob's father. This was taken from the base of the dam looking up. Also taken from the base of the dam as the water from the spillway is spilling out into the uh, Shoshone River. This was a building that the Chamber of Commerce put in place to sort of begin the visitor experience uh, at the Buffalo Bill Reservoir. And they hauled it in there and uh, set it down and- Sold pictures. Sold pictures and <laughs> visitor information. This is an aerial shot that Jack took. He was quite the pilot and uh, aerial photographer. And looking straight down on the dam and the dam hill, the dam road. And you can also see the old uh, footbridge, suspension bridge that went across the, uh, the canyon. That was a long time ago. That was supposed to be another rite of passage for us high schoolers. I never did it though. <laughs> Bob did. <laughs> the boards were rotten by the time you grew up. <laughs> yeah, thank goodness. <laughs> Another angle. 
And by the way, uh, there's this road right down here that comes up from the Bureau of Reclamation uh, projects down below. But there was always this road that goes right up to about here. And you could actually walk out and view the dam from up there if you knew how to get to that spot. And that's where a lot of these pictures were taken of the, uh, the dam road. Nice color picture. And the steps leading down from the, uh, the old road, down onto the top of the dam, the railing that was there, the concrete art, or, uh, wall on the lake side of the, uh, or the reservoir side of the dam. And they also had um, a whole bunch of lamps that rose up from, whoops, from right along the railing here and they were incandescent lamps. And I took a picture once a long, long time ago from down below the powerhouse up at the dam at night as it was lit up by those, uh, by those lamps. And it's pretty spectacular. I can't find that thing. <laughs> <laughs> and there's some of the water going down over the, the big bathtub drain of the original spillway. Parts of the original spillway are still visible today by the spillway gatehouse. Once the reservoir drops about 25 feet, you can still see the original concrete. And the water coming rushing out of the spillway. This is an interesting shot. Um, I don't remember just exactly when this was. Sometime in the 1950s, they actually lowered the, uh, they drained the water out of the, the reservoir and did some repair work down at the bottom of the dam. Um, that was a, that was a pretty strange time. I can remember going up with my father to the uh, the old boat club, and they were actually holding boat races in the dam, and they would go around the end of the. Uh, uh, the bench land that comes off the w w uh, east side of Sheep Mountain. And down in there, you could still see the tops of the cottonwood trees that they did not fell along the uh, edge of the Shosh south fork of the Shoshone before they raised the dam, before they started filling it. And it, it was pretty, it was pretty uh, uh, unusual to see that. Um, this shot is taken from the walkway at the west end of the powerhouse uh, where again there's a, uh, these iron steel rungs and everything that will let you down onto the, uh, uh, to the rock shore of the river when the, wither, when the river is somewhat lower than it is in this picture. And at the right time of day there's always this wonderful uh, rainbow that, uh, effect that you get with the sun over your shoulder, looking down at the, at the spillway. This was uh, taken during the winter, and as you can see, the level of the, of the lake is way down. And that's the, that's the throat of the, uh, of the spillway, and then of course the tunnel up above. This is where the cars used to come through, and later it was a pedestri pedestrian walkway for many, many years. Here's an interesting uh, aerial shot. The arch of the dam down here in the, uh, in the bottom. Here's the entire canyon and then it looks off to the east. The McCullough Peaks way up here and going out of this direction, you can see the Heart Mountain Canal, which was part of the whole Shoshone Irrigation Project that uh, essentially created the farmland that exists between Cody and Powell and all the way to Garland. Shot of the old road going uh, upriver. And when they lowered the, the uh, reservoir, first to do that, that work back in the 50s, and then uh, this particular image was taken uh, during that time, I think. But then there was the uh, construction that they did to raise the height of the dam and build the visitor center. 
And we had this same problem with the wind gusting down the North Fork and picking up the dust off the mud flats at the western end of the reservoir, which were no longer covered by water, and blowing it straight down the canyon and into Cody. <laughs> and uh, part of the construction of the new, uh, when we raised the dam, about a third of that total cost was for environmental control and uh, the dust dikes and uh, some work on the south fork of the Shoshone too. That's right. I, I might add that the dust dikes really work as long as they keep water behind them. Otherwise, the dust still blows. Uh, back when they were doing that construction, I took pictures of the, the dust that was blowing into Cody like this. And I sent them to Al Simpson, who was the, our U.S. Senator at the time. He had to paste it on the walkway between the rotunda and the Senate chambers so that everybody who walked through him past his office could see them. <laughs> Notice the... Uh, old 1930s car down here on the road. There were a couple of spots on that road, especially in this area, where you could only get a, a single car through at a time, and it was always on a corner. So when you came up to one of those corners, you, you would honk, and you would go at a very slow pace, because you, you didn't want to go rushing around the corner and meet somebody who was trying to rush around from the opposite direction, because there just wasn't enough room for two cars to pass. The horses you see, we took to Pahaska where Chew Frost ran the horse concession, and I got to help drive those horses 50 miles in a day from Cody to Pahaska. And I put these in here of my memories uh, of pushing the horses up through the canyon, a little bit of traffic in May, and we had flaggers out, but uh, we really played cowboy that day. These are the horses coming down from the old road that used to access um, the canyon prior to the uh, building of the Hayden Arch Bridge, which we will get into here a little bit later on. But they came down, and this is the spot where the, where the old road joins the, the new road and goes uh, further up the canyon. Share the road. <laughs> okay. And here are some uh, pictures. Of course, there's the siphon down there. But this is uh, shots of the helicopters as they were uh, erecting the uh, power lines down the canyon. Tip Cox, a local Marine and helicopter pilot, was flying that Hiller 12E. One of the problems of having the uh, road go up through that canyon was the fact that the, uh, the granite was weather uh, cracked and every once in a while it would collapse and there'd be a big rock slide on the road that would close the road for a certain period of time until they were able to get it uh, uh, reopened. That's one of those tight corners I was telling you about. <laughs> Way up here at the top, you can see one of the old original buildings from the uh, engineering and the power lines and whatnot. And this is the face where the rocks fell off onto the road. Looking, uh, aerial shot looking out past um, the dam, um, down the canyon. There's the siphon going across the canyon. Uh, Coulter's Hell in here. Town of Cody is over in this direction behind Cedar Mountain, and there's the snow covered McCullough Peaks in the background, and way off on the horizon of the Bighorns. And that siphon, uh, of course, d 
delivers water to the Heart Mountain Division of the Shoshone Project for about 35,000 acres of farmland. This is the uh, east end of the Shoshone Canyon, way back in the old days, when the only thing that was out there was the West Drive-In. How many in this ever attended the West Drive-In? What was your favorite movie at the West Drive-In? <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then over here across the river, that's where, uh, it's Coulter's Hell, and right down in here, over the edge of the, of the lip of the canyon is Damaris Hot Springs. This was the big, uh, the big crater out there in Coulter's Hell. Go ahead. Quick story, that's where one of Cody's finest police cars ended up. When we were in high school, one of the graduates ahead of us uh, became a policeman and was always stopping us high schoolers. And one night he left it running uh, down in front of a coffee hut and it disappeared. And uh, three weeks later, somebody flying over this crater out in Colder's Hell looked down and saw the upside down police car. Uh, and there it was. Uh, the young man was fired uh, because he left the engine running, the keys in it, and the doors unlocked. And I'll go no further with the story, but it, there's parts still down there. Another of uh, Jack Richards' aerial photos that shows the, the canyon and the old Cody Road going out the canyon, which is pretty much still there, but it's a lot wider now than it ever used to be. <laughs> If you look way down here in the bottom of the picture, you can see the Whitney Gallery of Western Art. This is before the uh, addition of the, the Buffalo Bill Museum and uh, the wedge in the, in the interior. There's the Catholic Church. Paul Stock's place out there on the end of Sunset Boulevard. And the Shoshone River winding its way down past Cody. Uh, clearing a rock slide, a rock slide and widening the, uh, the tunnels going through. This is that last tunnel before it starts to go up the damn hill. They used to have a tractor parked down there at the bottom of the hill in order to pull some of the tourists who came through with their, their big uh, camper trailers on the back end of the car. The damn hill was kind of steep. It was one of the reasons why the, the name ended with the letter N. Damn hill, <laughs> but uh, for a certain fee, they would pull the uh, uh, the whole rig, car and trailer, up to the top of the hill. <coughs> Did they also have uh, some young kids down there who would uh, uh, offer to drive people's cars up the top of the hill because they were scared spitless of the hill? <laughs> and that damn hill was treacherous. It was winter time. Really tough. Yeah. After a good snowfall, it was a nice skating rink at about a 40% grade. Okay, so more work on the, on the tunnels. This, I believe, is a picture of them in the process of drilling the big tunnel. Like, I mean, there's, we're back there. There, there's, there's no drive-through or anything like that. This was when they were, ex they were uh, drilling the, uh, the, the tunnels, and they did it from both ends of, of the tunnel uh, to put the highway uh, system uh, through, the, through the canyon. And uh, they did that, of course, in order to eliminate the, um, the damn hill so that uh, tourism could increase through Cody up to Yellowstone. We couldn't have tour buses go up the dam hill or through the narrow tunnels. When they built the new big tunnel, then we got tour buses coming to Cody. And the Chamber of Commerce and the businessmen really pushed to get that new tunnel in. Next. And voila, here is the, uh, the new access on the far side of the river going up one of the big turnouts there, and the tunnels. That's the first of the tunnels. There are three. There's one here, there's one there, and then there's the 
one kilometer long tunnel that goes all the way through the mountain. Again, drilled from, uh, from both directions. If I remember correctly, when they, when they finally broke through and, and came together, the, and they did this back in the days without any laser equipment or, uh, or fancy uh, GPS uh, equipment or anything like that. They did it with surveying transits. They were one quarter of an inch off of center. He was unhappy. Say what? The engineer was unhappy in his office. Yeah, the engineer was unhappy with that. Quarter of an inch, yeah, that's awful. <laughs> Another view of the, of the highway itself, there's the turnout that explains the, uh, uh, the, the Shoshone Canyon. There's a, the big bridge that goes across the, uh, the river. Uh, when they built it, it was the highest bridge in Wyoming until they built the bridge going over Sunlight Creek on the Chief Joseph Scenic Highway. This is when they were widening the road beyond the, the dam. They decided that, uh, again, those old tunnels were, were too dangerous and they slowed things up. They didn't start doing that until 1965 or 66, somewhere along in there. So you could come out of the tunnel, the big tunnel, and all of a sudden the road would narrow down and you'd go immediately through these little tiny tunnels. And the, and the twisty road that went along the, the edge of the, uh, above the, the level of the reservoir until you got out to this point here where the great big turnout is and all that uh, netting is, and steel netting to catch the rocks that still fall down every once in a while. So, one of the uh, big uh, detonations of dynamite to widen the road, and here's the results. An older picture of the spillway, the people walking down through the, uh, through the tunnel. And you can see that the new highway and tunnel has been put in place. And there was this parking lot there that you could pull into immediately as you came out of it. It's kind of dangerous, so eventually they moved it further down the highway to what we've got now. One of the things that some bright bureaucrat back in Washington, D.C. decided to do is they were worried about people walking along the, the road into the uh, to the dam above the spillway, and so they placed these tunnel sections, these little pedestrian tunnels, arch concrete tunnels. They were about ten or twelve feet long, and they, you know, they were built in sections, and they slid them into place. And uh, every once in a while, there'd be a win uh, a window that would look out uh, across it, and you could walk along in perfect safety and not have any rocks fall on you until one of the big rocks that did fall on the thing sliced it in half like a knife through a great big roll of, of bologna. I mean, it just <laughs> and there are, any, fortunately there were nobody, there was nobody in the tunnel at the time, but all the tourists who were on the far side of the tunnel at the dam were blocked off from their cars. And somebody had to come up the old damn hill road and take them down and all the way around to come back and get to their vehicles. The other thing that was interesting about that, that pedestrian tunnel is that it, it was truly a wind tunnel. When the wind blew up there, you could barely stand upright in that tunnel at the time. This is a hand-tinted color postcard of the Buffalo Bill Dam and the Dam Hill. And of course the power plant down in the bottom. I don't know how many they sold of that. I think that's a Hiscock photo. F.J. Hiscock, who was a local photographer. Now we have a whole bunch of photos of, uh, mixed with photos by Ned Frost, Jack Richard, and from the Wyoming Highway Department in the building of the Hayden Arch. This is Hayden. He was the engineer, the construction engineer, the man who designed the, the arch bridge. And this was an effort to eliminate the section of the highway, the, the road, 
you had to go across the old bridge in Cody on the what we call the Belfry Highway. You'd go across the, the bridge towards the depot, and then you'd take a left, and you would go along the northern side of the of Shoshone River up to the canyon, and then it would uh, continue on as, as we've seen in these other photographs. This was in order to eliminate that section of the road because it was wasn't the greatest of roads, shall we say. And it was very, very rocky. It was built across the Cody Bench, and it was full of boulders and, and river rock. And it, it just, it's like, it's like trying to travel, uh, travel on a cobblestone street. It was very bumpy. So here's that old road over here on the right, and somebody traveling along it. And this down here in the lower left is my grandfather, one of my grandfather's Studebakers. He had uh, started the Studebaker garage and sales, and he was the Studebaker distributor in uh, Park County for many, many years. And this was the, uh, the road that they were going to expand and turn into the Cody Road to Yellowstone. This is a, a spot just upriver from where the siphon is at nowadays. This is the site of the Hayden Arch. It actually went across the river from this abutment over to here. And you can see the road that had been partially completed to get down to this spot. This is looking back downriver from just above the, the spot where the, uh, the arch was built. This is right at the mouth of the canyon. And this is the spot where they started construction. The uh, following group of photos that we're looking at uh, were provided to us by the Wyoming Highway Department and our local uh, district office. There's a guy standing up here on the top and there's one down here on the bottom. Both banks looking east. So it's not quite as big an engineering project as the Buffalo Bill Dam was, but it was pretty excessive for its day. First of all, they had to build the abutments for the dam or for the uh, arch itself, and then they had to erect the uh, steel and wood uh, trestle that would support the building of the arch itself, the concrete arch that would hold up the, the uh, roadbed. And that's the West Pier. And digging out the road up above and some of the uh, uh, approaches to the, uh, to the piers. Let's see. And this is essentially the same road that we have today, but like I said, it's been re-engineered several times. It was quite the operation. West Pier again. You can see some of the riprap down below to protect the base of the uh, of the piers from floodwaters.
Then we're getting a little bit further into the construction project. We're looking over the East Pier at the West Pier. Getting ready to start building that arch. And they had to pour the concrete in place to create the arch itself. I'm not going too fast, am I? No, we're okay. running out of time. Yeah. <laughs> It'll take as long as it takes. Date on this one is the 12th, is the 15th of December, 1924. And this is some of the precast concrete railing that was used on the bed of the uh, of the bridge once they got it completed. starting to come together. One thing's for sure, it's a very beautiful bridge. We really knew how to build things back in those days. I believe it is on the historic register. Pretty sure, yeah. It was built in 90 days. Wow. It says, ready for the floor forms. They put them in place and cast the concrete for the floor of the bridge. We're just about done here. We're getting close. <laughs> this says Highway Boys, uh, June 1st, 25. Nellie Taylor Ross, who was the governor of Wyoming at the time. She dedicated the bridge. Thank you, Robin. And Yellowstone National Park Superintendent Horace Albright, who was also in attendance at the dedication. Uh, many of the photographs of the dedication were taken by my grandfather, Nick Frost, posing here with his Studebaker. And there's the completed bridge. And it's still there. It's not used by the highway anymore, but it's still there. You can, you can cross that to gain access to the canyon, uh, going up to the uh, Bureau of Reclamation uh, projects, the uh, powerhouse. And it's also uh, quite the recreation site. A lot of people will walk up there to uh, fish or will ride bicycles to go up, all the way up to the top of the damn hill and then come back down. We're gonna be talking about that here in just a moment. The new Cody Road. And then in this picture you can see up above is the old Cody Road going down and right back down around here is where the two joined. And then just around this corner is where the, the new highway bridge across the river was built. Well, this is the dedication ceremony. Robin, what day was that? Do you remember? I think it was June of 1925. That would be about right, June 1st, yeah. So it's quite the ceremony.
Read these carefully. <laughs> Shoshone Canyon, not dangerous. Drive carefully and avoid accident. <laughs> and there's the uh, new and improved highway going past the old bridge. Is this Hayden in a letter age? Yes. Okay. And a couple of last shots here. This is during that big flood back in the early 80s as I was telling you about. This is the, the old road, the old road underwater, <coughs> uh, and the old road being eroded by the river. That was just a really spectacular time, and it, it took out, um, there's a big outcropping of red dirt and rock uh, right there as you come into the canyon, just above the spillway, and the base of that uh, cliff was eroded by the raging torrents of, of water, and it slid into the, to the river, and it colored the river red. It looked like, it, it was very biblical, it looked like the river ran like blood. And that's our current Cody resident engineer, Todd Frost, a cousin of mine, and Bob's actually. <laughs> so this was our centennial celebration, which took place on January 15th, 100 years to the day that the dam was completed, and it was 46 degrees. It couldn't have been nicer. <laughs> we were all so thankful. <laughs> and Leslie, as you can see, is standing right over here on the extreme left of the, of the picture. And there's 295 other people across the top of the uh, uh, archway there on the top of the, of the dam. Uh, so we have Great Dam Day, um, the third Thursday in August every year, where we open the gate next to the visitor center for public access to hike the Old Dam Road and visit with some agencies that are in place along the Old Dam Road. We run ATVs that day to assist those who can't walk down or hike back up. And we usually have about a thousand people that show up. So the side gate is open from nine to three. And this year, Bob Richard will be signing some of his uh, travel books about Yellowstone. And we have, um, Fat Rack's barbecue on site, so if you want to pick up a sandwich, you can. It's a very busy day. It's a fun, positive day. This year, Wyoming PBS will be there to film and to interview some of our local historians, including Burl. And let's see what else. It's, it's just going to be a, a packed day. We want to recognize the modification project, which is a uh, 30-year milestone this year, as well as the 50-year anniversary of the uh, civil, civil Engineering Landmark dedication. Hope you can be there. Well, that'll be a lot of fun. And that's this Saturday. Yes. Again, 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. And that'll do it. Thank you, everybody. Uh, those who want to stay and ask some questions, uh, I really appreciate all of you being here, as well as our guests. Uh, and Mac, thank you. You did a good job. You ran thank over you. a little bit, but we'll work on that. Anyway, thank you very much. Any questions? I think you talked us to death. Here. <laughs> I'll be signing books. And upstairs. don't forget, Bob will be upstairs signing books in front of the bookstore. This is your big chance to get an autographed picture of one of Bob's books, autographed copy of one of Bob's books, so you're not going to want to miss that. Thank you very much for coming, everyone.